I've been shared, well I shared up to four messages from uh, the last 12 books of the Bible which are called the Minor Prophets. And they're, they're not called the Minor Prophets because they're less important, they're simply called Minor because of their size. They're smaller as compared to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. But we need to be honest with each other. Uh, the content of those books are, are really not that enjoyable. I mean, if you read them, you read basically, uh, you're brought face to face with the reality that the people of God, God's chosen people, the Israelites, basically disregarded God most of the time. And as a result, God uh, would chastise them, and th the books are filled with uh, basically warnings of uh, pending judgment. So it's not a lot of fun to read those passages. The overall message really is, don't take God for granted. And I think sometimes we do, don't we? We just presume God is good, God is great, and He's going to be all merciful to us, but we don't ever take into account that there's, there's a condition on that, that we need to be in relationship with Him that we need to include him in our lives. But like a prospector of gold, I've sift, been sifting through these, these 12 books of the Bible, and there are some passages that are worth taking a look at, uh, a second look at. And this morning I want to draw your attention to Amos, chapter 8, verses 11 to 12. Interesting passage. It says, The days are, are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. So, much like the day in which we live, during the time of Amos, there was freedom of religious speech. You could be who you wanted to be, you could express your faith in a way that was okay, and there'd be no chastisement. The, the priests held up the Torah in the temple, the prophets were proclaiming God's word, and yet in spite of the freedom and the abundance, the average person had no interest in God's word whatsoever. Maybe like today, people were distracted. They were distracted maybe with some of the other things that fill up our life. Um, you know, the, the pleasures of life. Maybe like today, people were working hard and they were just basically too tired to give God the time of day. So wrapped up, so absorbed in just living. Who has time to think about God? So many people today have a dusty Bible on their end table. They might have a family Bible shoved away in the closet. And so it was back then. There wasn't much appetite for God's Word. It was available to them. But there was no thirst, there was no hunger, a real disinterest. Now today we could at least comfort ourselves in the fact that many people t today do go to church on Sunday, or they stay home and they at least watch religious programming. And we could say that that's at least an indication that there's a hunger and a thirst for God in people and for His Word. But it's not so simple. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So in other words, it becomes like a buffet. You can belly up to the buffet and you can take what you want and leave what you don't want you can pick and choose. And a lot of people approach spirituality, their faith like that. I like that part in the Bible. I believe in that. That, that makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't believe in that. And they approach it like a buffet. They go to church and they hear God's word preached. Well, that makes me feel good. I like that. That makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't believe in that. It's like a buffet. And they're fooling themselves. They're just trying to appease their itching ears. It's an all or nothing, isn't it? God's word. God. Well, I guess what it comes down to is a lot of people want God on their terms, not God's terms. 
A number of years ago, I received a letter from a pastor friend of mine, and this is what he wrote. It was after a Sunday. He said, Hi, Doug. I trust all is well. Um, the reason I'm writing today is because I'm not doing too good. I'm a little down. I know it's Blue Monday, and I've tried to figure out why I'm feeling this way. It seems to be the same old, same old. My congregation seems to be the most unresponsive crowd on the face of the earth. Either that, or I am the most incredibly boring speaker that has ever existed. Well, you've heard him speak, and you know he's not an incredibly boring speaker. He said, and I'm not going to read all of it, but he says, sorry for going on and on, I just needed someone to dump on. And in this letter to me, he says, I don't get it. He doesn't understand why his people are not hungry and thirsty for God's word. But fake Christianity. We want what we want, we'll casually leave the rest. In physical terms, people usually suffer from a lack of appetite or a lack of thirst when they are sick, Right? If you're not feeling well, you're not hungry or thirsty. That's quite often a symptom. So is a lack of appetite for God's word symptomatic of spiritual sickness? Just a question. Good question. Again, in physical terms, people will not have an appetite for healthy foods because they're filling up on alternatives. Our kids come home from school. What do they do? They go to the freezer, they go to the fridge, they get a snack. Throw in a frozen pizza, or eat the, the, the cookies, whatever. They fill up on all this stuff. Fast food, junk food. They sit down at the table. Mom or dad has worked hard to make an excellent healthy meal for them. They're not hungry. Why aren't they hungry? Because they filled themselves up on junk. Could it be that people are not hungry or thirsty for God's word today because they have filled themselves up on junk. We're like barrels. We can be filled up, but there's a, there's a top. And after you start pouring in more on the top, it just starts to spill over and go down into the drain and off into the nether world, wherever stuff goes. Lake Erie. <laughs> Sorry about that, Lake Erie. Again, if we compare spirituality to physicality, where there is no physical hunger and, and there is no thirst, then malnutrition settles in, which in turn leads to more sickness like meningitis, malaria, and cholera. Stomachs enlarge, and you know what happens when we suffer from lack of hunger and thirst, and it continues. Spiritually speaking, if we don't have a hunger and thirst for God's Word, we're not filling our inner being with the... Well, Bible, the Bible says, Jesus said, you, man does not live alone, cannot live on bread alone. You need the Word of God. All right? So if that's not happening, then malnutrition settles in. And what are the symptoms? It's not meningitis or cholera in terms of spirituality, but it is a lack of compassion for people who are in need. Our hearts get, our hearts get hardened. And we don't care about morality. We'll just live our life our own way. These are symptoms of spiritual malnutrition. And as we fall back on our text this morning, we discover that God's patience for His people regarding their ambivalence towards His Word eventually will come to an end. Let's read it again. Today, the days are coming. The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. See, God told the people in Amos' day, because you just don't care, even though it's available, I'm just going to pull it away from you altogether. It won't even be available to you. And that's what's happened. The Assyrians came in, attacked them, exiled them back to Assyria, but they couldn't take the word with them. They, had, they didn't have it at their, at their grip. And if you read the Old Testament, the people of Israel, the children of God, there was, there was a cycle where they started to get disinterested in God, they began to live their lives as if there was no God, the enemy would come in, conquer them, they would be exiled, they'd go, oh, look what we've lost, and they would turn their hearts back to God and repent, they would be returned to their homeland where it was all given back to them, and then they would go through the whole cycle again. And God's saying there's coming a day when that will happen in our world as well.
The word famine indicates severity. In the mid-1800s, 500,000 people lost their lives in Ireland. Remember that? Wait. Irene was the only one there back then. <laughs> Don't you look at me like that. It was caused by a fungi. In 1991, 50,000 people died in the Sedan famine. It was caused by meningitis. Sometimes the causes are volcanoes, drought, floods, abuse of political power, overpopulation, but the famine of God's word in Amos' time was to be caused by God himself because the people weren't taking advantage of it and putting it into their hearts. And here's the truth. Whatever we read in the scriptures, the days are coming. Th those, those words are used by the prophets not only to suggest what is going to happen to the people of their day, but panoramically projecting to our day when the end is going to happen. And the Bible says that the end will happen before the Millennium Kingdom and all that stuff. There's going to be a tribulation. And during that tribulation, it's going to be kickstarted by the fact that the Holy Spirit will be removed and the Bible will be removed. People during the tribulation will want God's word, but it will not be there for them. They will look everywhere, but it will have been too late. If you decide to read your Bible this year, you will notice that there's that repetitive cycle amongst the Israelites where they disregard, alienate themselves from God, get exiled, repent, come back, and it goes over and over again. And then after the Babylonian um, came in and then they were returned, the most emotive passage in all the scripture is when Ezra rediscovers in the temple the Torah, and he opens it up and he begins reading to the people. And they have been so thirsty, and they've been so hungry, because they've realized what it is that they've been without, that they begin to weep as he reads day after day the scriptures. And yet, we have it everywhere. And how important is it to us? How often do we read it? How often do we sit and listen to it with hungry and thirsty hearts? It's in your pew. It's at home on your shelf. It's preached here every week. What are you doing with it? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? For God's word. Two children discovered a new word when they were upset with each other. It was hate. The one would say, I hate you. And the other one would say, well, I hate you as well. And mom decided to involve herself. She says, well, I'm not taking two children that hate each other to McDonald's today. Hmm. The five-year-old thought to himself, he says, well, says to his younger brother, I really don't hate you. And the one who's just a little bit younger says, well, I still hate you because I'm not hungry. <laughs> Our hunger, or lack of it for God's word, affects our attitudes and everything. Let me close this morning with an excerpt from one of C.S. Lewis's books, The Narnia Chronicles. One of the um, books was called The Silver Chair. And, uh, of course, Aslan, Aslan is the lion. It's a, a picture, a portrait of Jesus metaphorical form, and it's all about thirst. Jill is talking with Aslan, the lion, about thirst. She's very thirsty, but she's also fearful of the lion, because like our Lord, merciful but great and terrible if you're not on his good side. Let's read it. She says, if I run away, it, Aslan, will be after me in a moment, thought Jill, and if I go on, I shall run straight into its mouth. Anyway, she couldn't have moved if she had tried, and she couldn't take her eyes off it. How long this lasted, she could not be sure. It seemed like hours. And the thirst became so bad that she almost felt she would not mind being eaten by the lion, if only she could be sure of getting a mouthful of water first. Are you thirsty? asked the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? Would you mind going away while I do? said Jill. 
The lion answered, answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at his motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to, not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill. I make no promises, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she asked. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. And it didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I dare come and drink, said Jim. <laughs> then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred to Jill to disbelieve the lion. No one who had seen his stern face could do that. And her mind suddenly made itself up. It was the worst thing she ever had to do, but she went straight to the stream, knelt down and began scooping up water in her hand, and it was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You didn't need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. And before she tasted it, she had been intending on making a dash away from the line the moment she had finished. But now she realized that this would be on the whole the most dangerous thing. What does this mean to you? And how thirsty, and how hungry have you been for God and His Word in your life? Heavenly Father, Your Word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And we are told that like living water, satisfies the deepest desires of our heart. Forgive us for being so foolish and filling our barrels on the junk. Help us, Lord, to turn to you and your word and to find our fulfillment there. We ask this of you, the great and terrible and yet merciful lion. Jesus Christ.